Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our services at Hawkwood Baptist Church this May 31st weekend. God, the creator of the universe, has invited us into his presence today to worship him. Adu and some of our worship team members will be leading us as we give him our praise and our honor and our glory this morning. We'll also be exploring another character from the Bible, Jonah, who received a wake-up call from God in our current sermon series. Right now, let's prepare our hearts for worship as Neil reads for us a passage from God's Word about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm reading from Philippians 2, verse 6 to 11. Please listen to God's Word as we prepare our hearts for worship. Though Christ Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the, the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Join me and our worship team as we praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do declare today that the name of Jesus is the most beautiful name that we could ever know. Father, as we gather together in his name, the name of Jesus, we celebrate all that you have done for us in and through your son. We thank you that he died for our sins upon the cross so that we could be restored to relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, that he rose again from the dead three days later, and that because of his resurrection, we have hope. And today, Lord, we celebrate that hope that is found in him. Father, we pray today for each person who is listening. Father, would you pour out your grace and make yourself real to them in the exact ways that they need today. Father, whatever it is that they are facing or that they are walking through, whatever way that they need to hear from you and to experience, Lord, your love, would you make that real today? Would you make yourself real to them? And would you provide the grace that they need? Father, we thank you for what you have in store for us as we continue to worship you. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you are doing among us. We pray this in the mighty and powerful, the wonderful, the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Well, right now, I want to invite you to stay tuned and to listen to a children's version of the character that we're going to explore today in our sermon. His name is Jonah. Watch this. Hey, friends. Megan and Jesse here. And Goldilocks. Oh, hello, Goldilocks. I'm so glad you could join us for our Bible story today. I thought Goldilocks would enjoy hearing about today's Bible story in which Jonah gets swallowed by one of her ancestors. <laughs> Good idea, Jesse. But did you know the story of Jonah is not mostly about Jonah getting swallowed by a big fish? It's not? But there is a picture of a big fish on the front of my Bible story book about Jonah. Are you sure, Megan? I'm sure, Jesse. The book of Jonah in the Bible is mostly about God showing mercy to people who do not deserve it. Let me tell you the story. Listen for who God showed mercy to. Jonah was a prophet. One day, God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. The people have been doing very bad things. Tell them to stop. Jonah was afraid. The people in Nineveh did not love God, and they were very mean. So Jonah ran the other way. He got on a boat to go far away. God sent a storm and the sailors on the boat were scared. They cried and asked their false gods for help. The sailors cast lots, like flipping coins or tossing dice, to figure out who to blame for all this trouble. The lot fell on Jonah. The sailors asked Jonah, Who are you? What are you doing here? Where did you come from? Jonah said, I am one of God's people. I worship the one true God who made everything. The sailor shouted, tell us what to do. Jonah said, throw me into the sea. So the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him over the side of the boat. God sent a big fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to God. He thanked God for sending the fish to save him. Then the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Tell the people my message. This time, Jonah went to Nineveh. He walked around the city and shouted, In 40 days, God will destroy Nineveh. The people in Nineveh stopped doing bad things. They showed God that they were sorry. So God decided not to destroy Nineveh. 
I knew you would do this, Jonah said to God. You are a gracious God. You do not give people what they deserve. You are slow to get angry, and you love people. I am so mad. Is it right for you to be mad? God asked Jonah. Jonah left Nineveh and made a shelter outside the city. God taught Jonah a lesson. God made a plant to shade Jonah from the sun. Jonah was happy. Then God sent a worm. The worm ate the plant, and the plant died. Then God sent wind. Jonah was so hot, he almost fainted. He was not happy. God asked, Are you mad that the plant died? Yes, said Jonah. God said, You cared about the plant. But you did not take care of it or make it grow. The city of Nineveh has many people. They need help. I made them, and I care about them. Aren't people more important than a plant? God told Jonah to go to his enemies and tell them to stop sinning. Jonah did not want to go. Later. God sent his own son Jesus to tell his enemies to stop sinning. Unlike Jonah, Jesus wanted to obey God. He died on the cross to save us from sin. Good morning, everyone. Our sermon scripture reading today comes from the book of Jonah, chapters 3 and 4. Listen to God's word. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to tarnish. I knew you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Then the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged a leafy plant to grow there. And soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. 
It came quickly and died quickly. But Nunavut has more than 120 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? This is the word of the Lord. May he bless its readings on our lives. to see you this morning. Let us go to prayer. Father, we thank you for love and grace upon us. We worship you in your holiness. You are so good all the time. You have given us the greatest gift, your only son who lived a perfect life that we could not live. He endured a criminal's death that we could not have endured. He rose from the dead victorious after paying our debt in full. We bless you, Lord. And Lord, please bless Pastor Kent th this morning as he delivers your message to us. And Holy Spirit, please teach us your truth. Open our eyes to see wondrous things out of your word today. We are hungry, so feed us, Lord. 
Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, for we pray to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. Have you ever driven too fast and unsafely through traffic and rationalized your behavior because you were late to an important meeting or event? The next day, when someone cut you off on the road, did you deduce that there was only one simple observable explanation? The other driver is a jerk? Why do we tolerate double standards like this? A study by researchers at the University of Toronto and James Madison University concluded that it's because we cut ourselves more slack than we give to others. The study says that this is due to bias blind spots, mismatches between how we evaluate others and ourselves. Writing about this story in The New Yorker, Jonah Lehrer says, when considering the irrational choices of a stranger, we are forced to rely on how they behave. We see their biases from the outside, which allows us to glimpse their errors. However, what when assessing our own bad choices, we tend to engage in elaborate introspection. We study our motivations and search for relevant reasons. We lament our mistakes to therapists and ruminate on the beliefs that led us astray. Lehrer concludes, our bias blind spots are largely unconscious, which means they remain invisible to self-analysis and resistant to intelligence. In other words, being smarter won't help you see your own junk. As a matter of fact, more intelligence may add to the problem. Bias blind spots likely account for study results by researchers who ask husbands and wives what percentage of the housework they do. In their book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, Carol Travis and Elliot, Elliot Aronson indicate that the wives say, Are you kidding? I do almost everything, at least 90%. The husbands say, Oh, I do a lot, about 40%. Although the specific numbers differ from couple to couple, Travis and Aronson assert that the total always exceeds 100% by a significant margin. It's tempting to conclude that one spouse is lying, but it's more likely that each is remembering in a way that enhances his or her contribution. They both have bias blind spots. Another word for bias blind spots is self-righteousness. The Oxford Uni University Press Dictionary defines self-righteousness as having a certainty, especially an unfounded one, that one is totally correct or morally superior. Our story today is about a man who was full of self-righteousness. He was a prophet from the nation of Israel, who lived in the reign of King Jeroboam II from 786 to 746 BC. His name? Jonah. Jonah is another character we're exploring in our current sermon series, Wake Up Call. Jonah received two wake up calls from God. His first wake up call occurred on, on board a ship bound for Tarshish. Traditionally, many scholars believe Tarshish was a Phoenician settlement in southern Spain. One thing is for sure, Tarshish was about as far as he could get from where God had told Jonah to go, Nineveh. Nineveh was a cosmopolitan city in the nation of Assyria. It sat on the Tigris River just across from modern-day Mosul in northern Iraq. Nineveh was northeast of Israel. Tarshish was due west almost at the end of the known world. Jonah was on a ship bound to Tarshish, fleeing from God. God had told him to go to Nineveh and confront the people's wickedness there, but Jonah refused. The Bible says that the Lord sent a storm so violent that even the seasoned sailors feared for their lives. They did everything they could to keep the ship from sinking, but their fate still hung in the balance. The Bible reveals that the sailors sensed the storm could be an instrument of God's judgment towards someone on board. So 
They cast lots, kind of like modern day dice, to determine the culprit. The dice indicated that Jonah was to blame. They asked Jonah about his identity, home country, and religious affiliation. When he replied that he was a Hebrew who worshipped the God of creation, they were terrified. They asked him what they should do to calm the storm. Jonah told them to throw him overboard. At first they refused. They may have been rough and rugged sailors, but they weren't murderers. However, the storm's intensity increased and they became even more desperate. The Bible says that the sailors prayed and asked God to forgive them for taking Jonah's life by throwing him overboard. However, they had come to believe that they were following divine direction. In this case, they were. In fact, the Bible says that as soon as they threw Jonah overboard, the sea grew calm and they feared and worshipped God. Jonah surely thought he was a goner, and he should have been. He was not just up a creek without a paddle. He was in the middle of the vast Mediterranean Sea with no lifeboat, no emergency position indicator beacon, nor even a PDF. He had run out of hope. He prepared himself to die. But God had a different plan. Rather than giving Jonah what he deserved, God was preparing a wake-up call. In chapter 1, verse 17, we read that a great fish swallowed Jonah. By the way, the Hebrew word translated fish in English, as well as the Greek word translated fish used by Jesus when he references Jonah in the New Testament, doesn't clearly indicate whether it was a huge fish, a whale, a whale shark, or a now-extinct marine reptile. The only thing that's clear is that it was huge with a mouth large enough to swallow a man whole. For three days and nights, Jonah was inside the fish. Some people question the story saying, what fish could have been big enough to swallow Jonah? Marine scientists today know that at least two species of whales, sperm and blue whales, as well as two shark species, whale sharks and great whites, have mouths large enough to swallow a man whole. Other questions include how Jonah could have survived without oxygen inside the fish and outlasted the acidic digestive juices. Perhaps the most reasonable response is that if God created the entire universe out of nothing, he could overcome these relatively lesser challenges. Jesus believed the story of Jonah, and he proved we could trust his words by doing what no other man has done in the history of humanity, rising from the dead after three days. What's a bigger miracle, surviving three days inside a big fish or rising from the dead after three days? Whatever the specific sea creature God called into service, Jonah had plenty of time to think about and turn from his disobedience. Chapter 2 reveals that the prayer of repentance and worship he prayed inside the fish was genuine. In chapter 2, verse 10, we read that Jonah responded to God's wake-up call with humility. The Lord then commanded the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry land, and it did. By the way, God was gracious and gave Jonah a second chance to obey. But God doesn't always give second chances. Rebellion toward God is serious business. We should never presume that God will grant us a second, third, or fourth chance. God tells Jonah a second time to go to Nineveh and preach to the people there. This time, Jonah doesn't attempt to run away from God. He obeys. He's learned his lesson about obedience. But Jonah needs to learn another lesson. The second lesson is going to require a second wake-up call. Jonah makes the month-long trek to Nineveh. Chapter 3, verse 4 tells us that on the day of his arrival, he wastes no time and begins preaching. He delivers a noticeably short sermon. Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Unlike other listeners of antiquity and modernity who scoff at or ignore prophetic calls to return to God and his ways, the Bible tells us the Ninevites took Jonah's message to heart en masse. Chapter 3, verse 5 says this, 
The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. In the next verse, we learn that the Spirit of God was so powerfully at work among the people that when news of Jonah's message reached the king, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. The Ninevites were struck to the core by Jonah's message of impending judgment from God. Even though Jonah had not offered an escape clause, they must have surmised that if God had given them a 40-day warning, there was at least a chance that judgment could be averted if they came clean. How did God respond to their wholesale repentance? In verse 10 in chapter 3, we read, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The Lord demonstrated the truth found in the scriptures that he's a God who's ready to forgive, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We also see in God's response proof of his promise in Jeremiah 18.8 that if a nation he is warned of judgment repents of its evil, he will relent and not inflict on it the disaster he had planned. You would think Jonah would be jumping up and down for joy that his wake-up call to the Ninevites has been heeded and that hundreds of thousands of people have been spared dire calamity. But this is not the case. In chapter 4, verse 1, we are told that Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He says, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. Ah, now we know why Jonah disobeyed God earlier in our story. He guessed that God would show compassion to the Ninevites rather than dishing out his wrath upon them. Jonah wanted God to fry them. They were wicked and deserved to die. They had made their bed, now they could lie in it. They weren't a part of God's chosen people. They were wicked, so they deserved death. This response from Jonah is quite incredible. Just a little over a month earlier, God had spared him from judgment in the sea. God had shown compassion when Jonah repented of his sin of disobedience. Jonah seems to have totally forgotten the undeserved mercy that God had shown towards him. But God saw another deficiency within Jonah's life. The sea experience had not fully dealt with Jonah's bias blind spots. Jonah was consumed with self-righteousness. He could see the faults of others, but couldn't see his own pride and spiritual smugness. Jonah hadn't learned that God doesn't delight in zapping people. God delights in them turning away from their rebellion and self-sufficiency and admitting their need for and dependency upon him. What does Jonah's, Jonah do? Verse 5 says that he goes outside the city to wait and see what will happen. He makes a small shelter on a hill east of Nineveh where he has a great view of the sprawling metropolis. But his tiny shelter roof isn't large enough to provide adequate shade. Daytime temperatures in the desert of northern Iraq can hit 45 degrees Celsius. It's in this scorching heat that God has compassion on Jonah. Verse 6 tells us that God causes a gourd plant, a vine with huge leaves, to quickly spring up next to his shelter and grow tall enough to provide Jonah with relief from the intense desert sun. 
But remember that we said God would choose to give Jonah a second wake-up call. The next morning, Jonah receives it. At dawn, God provides a worm which chews the vine, causing it to wither in the early morning sun. Jonah's shade is quickly gone. God arranges for that day to be extra hot and for a scorching desert wind to blow. Jonah becomes so hot that he becomes faint and suffers the effects of heat exhaustion. In fact, he may have been close to sunstroke. Verse 8 tells us that he wants to die and says, Death is certainly better than living like this. God replies, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorts, even angry enough to die. God now lowers the hammer upon Jonah. He says, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it here. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? God ends his second wake-up call to Jonah with a short argument that the souls of the people of Nineveh are infinitely more important than the vine plant that provided shade to the prophet. If Jonah felt sorry for the vine, his compassion for the people of Nineveh should have been much, much greater. Like he did for Jonah, is God giving you a wake-up call today about self-righteousness? Perhaps you're a God-fearer like Jonah. Perhaps you've chosen to put your trust in Jesus, God's Son. But like Jonah, you're plagued by bias, blind spots. You easily see the faults and sins of others and believe they should get what they have coming. Perhaps like the unmerciful slave referenced by Jesus in Matthew 18, you've forgotten how much God has forgiven you. God is calling you today to heed his wake-up call to recognize your bias blind spots, to remember the undeserved mercy he's shown you, and to allow his compassion for others to take deep root in your heart. He's calling you to feel his love for those who don't yet know him, who are walking in spiritual darkness, and to tell them the truth, the truth that God has made forgiveness and cleansing available through his son Jesus who died for their sins on the cross. Will you respond to God's wake-up call today? Will you agree with God about your self-righteousness? Will you remember how much God has forgiven you and allow him to fill you with his compassion for others? Perhaps you're not a Christ follower. Perhaps you're not sure God even exists. Did you know that you too can be self-righteous as a skeptic, agnostic, or atheist? You can think you're better, smarter, or more authentic than others. Your bias blind spots keep you from acknowledging the meaninglessness and futility of existence in a universe that is totally random, in a universe without a creator. Your unwillingness to respond to the evidence God, God has provided that he's real, that he made the universe, that Jesus rose bodily from the dead, and that the Bible is a trustworthy record of God's revelation to humanity holds you in bondage and separates you from the life God desires you to experience now and for eternity. Will you choose to respond to God's wake-up call today? Will you lay down your agnostic self-righteousness? Will you choose to embrace the truth that you need God, that you're a sinner separated from your creator, and that God has made a way for you to be restored to relationship with him through his son, Jesus? If you do, like he did with the Ninevites, God will not give you what you deserve. He will have compassion and extend to you forgiveness 
healing, and restoration. He loves you and invites you to turn to him in repentance and faith today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wake-up call that you gave, the wake-up calls that you gave to Jonah about his bias blind spots and his self-righteousness. Thank you that today you are giving each one of us a wake-up call about our bias blind spots, about our self-righteousness. God, I pray for myself and for each person listening that we would heed your wake-up call today, that we would allow you to change our hearts from the inside out. And Lord, that we would come to see other people around us through your eyes, through your eyes of love and compassion and mercy. And God, that you would use us as instruments of your love and compassion and your truth to the world in spiritual darkness, to a world that so desperately needs to know you and to be restored to relationship with you. Father, let your work have its full impact in our lives this day, for we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If God has been stirring your heart today through this message, so through any part of our worship service, I invite you to, to let me know about that. You can email me, Pastor Kent, and the email address is hbc at hawkwood.ca. I'd love to hear what God is speaking to you, what God is stirring within your heart, and have the opportunity to be able to pray for you and to um, interact with you by email. I pray God's blessings upon each one of you. Let's let this next song led by our worship team become our prayer today.
I hope that you are choosing to allow the words of that song we just sang to be your prayer this morning. Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I hope you're choosing to pray along with me that God would show you any bias blind spots and that he would remove any self-righteousness from our hearts and that he would fill us with his compassion and love for others around us, that we would see them with God's eyes. By the way, one of the ways that we can do that practically is by sharing a need if we have it or by offering to help to meet the needs of others. And you can do that on our website at hbc at hawkwood.ca. I want to say thank you to those of you who are faithfully giving your tithes and offerings during this pandemic. God is using those to be a part of meeting the needs of others and then and the helping to to forward the ministry of our church. I want to say thank you for that. And for those of you who would like to give but don't know how, you can see those ways on your screen right now. For others, this is a tough time for you financially. You've lost a job or you have reduced hours. I just want you to know that we care about you. And if you'll let your need be known, we will pray diligently for you, to God, for God to provide for you. I hope that you have a wonderful week this week. It's been a great joy to be together. Go this week and see through the eyes of God, sharing his love and compassion with everyone you come in contact with. God bless you.